Chapter Seventeen of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Seventeen in the Red Jinn's Castle. While Jinnicky and his friends had been having all these ups and downs and hair-raising experiences, Gludwig had passed an exceedingly pleasant and profitable evening. As his enemies had dropped into the cellar of the castle, the silver staff of Planety missing him by a wide margin had fallen harmlessly at his feet. Gludwig's army had had much to say of this terrible weapon, and picking it up he turned it gloatingly over and over in his hands. It is true that he had all of Jinnicky's treasures and possessions, but in his whole seven months in the castle he had not discovered a way to use any of the Red Jinn's magic, nor been able to cast a single spell or transformation. This had taken half the zest out of his victory. But here he had a simple and easily managed magic weapon. Or had he? Frowning suddenly, Gludwig wondered whether it only worked for the Silver War Maiden who had used it so disastrously against his men. Well, he would quickly find that out. Stepping to the door, he whistled for the huge hound that guarded the outer passageway. As it came bounding to his side, he hurled the silver staff at its head. As the staff struck, the hound's progress was instantly arrested, and instead of a live dog, he had a life-size bronze with a look in the eyes that made even Gludwig turn away. But the staff did work. As it returned to his black hand, Gludwig hurried out of the throne room, rushing here and there about the castle, to cast the staff again and again at his unsuspecting aides and servants. "'Are you mad?' hissed Glubdo, coming upon his brother, in the act of petrifying a small boot-boy. "'If you continue in this reckless fashion, who will do the work or wait upon us?' "'Oh, I've only tried it on a dozen or so,' said Gludwig, holding the staff jealously behind his back. "'Mind you don't overstep your authority, brother, or I might be tempted to use it on you.' Chuckling wickedly at Glubdo's shocked expression, Gludwig mounted to his own quarters, and hastily throwing off his clothes, curled up in Jinnicky's sumptuous ruby-trimmed four-poster. He was too weary to descend to the cellar and deal with his enemies and resolving to finish them off the first thing in the morning, the miserable impostor fell asleep, Planety's magic staff clutched tightly in his hands. While he slumbered, strange things were happening below stairs, for just as the clock in the tower told two, Ginger noiselessly set his royal passengers down in the deserted throne room and vanished away with a flashing smile. Snapping on a ruby lamp, the red gin looked around him with a long sigh of content. Motioning for Kabumpo to place the sleeping princess on his comfortable cushioned throne, he tiptoed about, touching one after another of his possessions. "'Where do you suppose he is?' whispered Randy, treading close behind him. "'I don't suppose I know,' Jinnicky whispered back. "'Where would he be but in my own royal bed?' Come along, we'll take him by surprise, and the ears, and throw him out of the window. Careful now, boys, step softly. Confound the black-hearted scoundrel. He's been using the silver staff. Sorrowfully, the little gin paused before the statue of his favorite dog. Never mind, comforted Randy. When you find a way to restore Planety, she'll find a way to undo this mischief. And you know you still have Nina. Yes, said Jinnicky, placing the Nonagon cat tenderly on a red cushion. Come on, then. We'll creep up on him. Nobody's around. Nobody's on guard. This should be easy. Stepping softly up the broad stair, Kabumpo as lightly as any of them, the three made their way to Jinnicky's vast bedroom. Leave him to me, begged the elegant elephant in a fierce whisper. I'll wring his neck with my own trunk. "'No, wait, I'll ring my dinner bell,' puffed Jinnicky, "'and have Ginger carry him to the other side of the Nonestic Ocean.' 
"'Even that wouldn't be far enough,' muttered Randy, tiptoeing over to the bed. "'If we just knew where he had hidden Planety's staff, "'we could turn him into a big brass monkey, "'for that's just what he looks like.' "'Ho, oh, I do, do I?' "'The unexpected interruption made them all jump. "'Gludwig, wakened by Kabumpo's first whisper, "'had lain silently, watching from beneath his long lashes. "'Now, tossing back the silk covers, he sprang up, throwing the staff straight at Randy's heart. "'Now let's see what you'll turn to,' he panted savagely. Too startled to move or act, Kabumpo and Jinnicky watched, in fascinated horror, as the staff struck. And strike it did, but instead of petrifying Randy, the rod passed like a flash of lightning through the young king's body, and returned to Gludwig's hand, leaving Randy live and lively as ever he was, lively enough, in fact, to leap forward, snatch the dangerous weapon, and bring it down hard on his red-wigged head. With a thud that splintered Jinnicky's best bed, Gludwig fell back. "'Ha! What did I tell you?' exclaimed Randy. And indeed the former holder of the castle, in his petrified condition, looked as much like a brass monkey as Randy had said he would. "'Oh, my mercy me! Oh, my! Oh, me!' With trembling fingers, the red gin began to feel Randy all over. "'With my own eyes I saw that staff go through you, lad. Yet here you are, no mark, no statue. I declare I'm—' With tears running down his nose, Jinnicky embraced Randy over and over. "'Out of that bed with you!' screamed Kabumpo. Out! And winding his trunk round the rigid Gludwig, he flung him violently out of the window. As the image fell with a resounding clunk into the vegetable garden below, the elegant elephant sank on his haunches and mopped his brow with one of the red silk bedsheets. Never, never do I hope to live through such a moment again, he groaned, blowing his trunk explosively. I thought you were frozen and done for, my boy, done for. Rocking to and fro, Kabumpo blinked the tears out of his eyes. I don't understand yet why I wasn't, admitted Randy, wriggling out of Jinnicky's grasp and touching the spot where the staff had struck him. Someone or something was protecting you, declared the little Jinn, nodding his head like a mandarin. Do you carry any charms or talismans against evil, my boy? Not a one. Turning out his pockets, Randy displayed a collection of knives, rubber bands, coins, and the other odds and ends that a man usually stores in his pockets. Among the strange assortment were two small squat jars, and on these Jinnicky pounced with a triumphant little crow. Why, Randy Spandy Jack-a-Dandy, you have two bottles of my best weapon, turning elixir. How did you happen to have them? Those? Randy squinted down at the bottles in positive mystification. Oh, I must have picked them up in the cellar. Of course I did. I remember distinctly now. Oh, glory be, glory me, har, har, har. Am I a good wizard or am I a good wizard? And to think you should have happened on the very thing you'd be needing. Jinnicky danced in exuberant circles. Shh, hush, somebody's coming. Crowding all his belongings back into his pocket, Randy turned in alarm. Half the courtiers and servants were crowded into the doorway, and when they saw Jinnicky and his friends instead of Gludwig in the royal apartment, they began to back away in chagrin and embarrassment. "'Oh, it's all right,' Jinnicky waved airily. "'You threw in your fortunes with the wrong man, that's all. You'll find Gludwig below in the cabbages. But I forgive you.' I forgive you, he added impulsively, as his former mine workers began to stammer apologies and excuses. Go back to your beds now, but see that breakfast is on time and hot and appetizing. With an impatient nod of his head, Jinnicky dismissed them, and looking very downcast and crestfallen, they hurried away. It was a long time before the Red Jinn and his rescuers could bring themselves to retire. There was so much to talk of, to wonder over, and to plan. But finally, even Randy acknowledged that he was sleepy, 
and confident that Jinnicky would find some way to help Planety and Thun in the morning, he curled up on a small red sofa and fell into a peaceful slumber. As for Kabumpo, he stretched out on the floor, and Jinnicky, not caring to occupy a bed so recently slept in by Gludwig, made himself comfortable on a bare rug beside the elegant elephant, enjoying the first real rest he had had in seven long months. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. The Red Gin Restored. Word of his return had quickly spread through the Red Jinn's vast dominions, and when Jinnicky and his guests descended next morning, a whole loyal Black Legion were cheering from the courtyard and lined up along the shore. After Gludwig had seized the castle and enslaved the household, the rest of the natives had fled for their lives, refusing to stay or acknowledge the red-wigged impostor as the ruler. Now that Jinnicky was restored and safely at home again, their joy knew no bounds. Appearing briefly on one of the castle balconies, the red jinn made one of his best and merriest speeches, telling all of his experiences and assured his faithful flock that Goodleg was gone and would trouble them no more. To prove his statement, he pointed to the fallen figure in the cabbage patch. Glubdo, fearing Jinnicky's anger, had already left for an unknown destination, and now there was nothing to be done but restore the kingdom to its former cheerful status and prosperity. While the red jinn, Kambumpo, Randy, and Nina breakfast happily on the terrace, a willing delegation marched off to the ruby mines to release Ali Babo, the courtiers and servants from their long servitude, the miners who had taken their place in the castle and army were only too willing to return to the mines, for with Jinnicky back in power, their hours were short, their wages high, and each miner had his own cozy cottage and garden. The petrified miners who had served in the army that issued out to capture Randy and Kambupo were stood along the highways to act as signposts and also as warnings to all of the hard fate awaiting those who lent their ears to treachery and their arms to rebellion. Randy could hardly contain himself while all these necessary matters were attended to. The young monarch spent nearly all his time arranging and rearranging the cushions on Jinnicky's throne, where Planety still lay in complete beauty and insensibility. Kambupo was almost as bad, pacing anxiously between the throne and the terrace where Thun had been carried by fifty interested blacks. Even if I cannot bring them back to life and activity, they are a handsome addition to any castle, puffed Jinnicky, sinking down at last on one of his red lacquer sofas and fanning himself rapidly with his lid. Oh, my mercy me! Don't look at me that way, my boy! Of course I'll do my best and double best, but suppose my best is not good enough. Oh, it will be, declared Kambupo, giving the red gin a little pat on the back with his trunk. I'll bet on your red magic any day in the year. Look at the way that Alexer saved Randy from the magic staff. Where is Planety's staff, by the way? sort of dangerous to leave it about 
It's locked up safely in my iron cabinet, said Jinnicky, closing one eye. So you really think I'm good, old Gabosius? Better even than the Wizard of Oz, eh? Oh, much, asserted the elegant elephant, wagging his head positively. All right, then. Leave me. Leave me, begged the red jinn fairly pushing them out of the throne room i've ordered all my magic brought to me here and here i'll stay till this pretty little princess and her charger come out of this metal trance my mercy me trance entrance entrancing oh har 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 i've an idea there my boys bouncing off the sofa jinnicky skipped over to the princess of another planet oh kambupo do you think he really has whispered randy as he and the elegant elephant hurried through the door of the throne room and closed it softly behind them end of chapter eighteen Chapter 19 of The Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 19 Red Magic. The hours Randy and Kabumpo spent waiting for Jinnicky to summon them to his throne room were the longest and most anxious they had ever endured. Even if he does restore them, groaned Randy, pacing feverishly up and down one of the garden paths, he'll have to send them straight back to another planet. Rumpling up his hair, he looked wildly back at the elegant elephant, who was just behind him. And if they go, declared the young king in a desperate voice, I warn you, Kabumpo, I shall jump on Thun's back and go with them. What, and leave me, gasped the elegant elephant, putting back his ears, and your kingdom and friends and all your responsibilities? No, no, Randy, this won't do. Besides, you probably perish in that outlandish metal wilderness, with nothing to eat and no place to rest your head. You can't do it, my boy, and furthermore, I won't let you. Snatching Randy up in his trunk, he held him as tightly as if he were already running away instead of threatening to do so. In the course of his bitter argument, and as the young monarch began pummeling Kabumpo futilely with his fists, they were both lifted bodily into the air and set swiftly down in the red throne room. "'The master has good news for you,' explained Ginger. "'Look!' With his flashing white grin, the little bellboy pointed to the throne itself, and then, as was his wont, inexplicably vanished. What he saw made Randy rush forward and fling both arms round the red gin's neck. "'Oh, you did it! You really did it!' he cried, embracing Jinnicky all over again. "'How can I ever thank you enough?' "'Where am I?' murmured the clear silvery voice that Kabumpo and Randy knew so well. Oh, what a netiful, netiful castle. Randy, Randy, and there you are, big Bumpo and Thun, but how did we come out of that debasement? Without bothering to answer, Randy seized Planety's hands and looked and looked at her as if he were never going to stop. You're the same and yet different, he mused, scarcely able to believe what he saw. And Thun is the same yet different, too. I am Thun the Thunder Colt. Now, then, and always, announced Thun, and gave a frightened jump, for he had actually spoken the words at the same time they went spiraling up into a sparkling sentence over his head. Oh, princess, princess, he whinnied joyously. Do you hear? Do you see? I can talk, I can hear, I can see and hear myself talking. At each word Thun gave an ecstatic bound then began racing madly round and round the throne room, in and out between the red pillars, leaping over chairs and tables in a positively hair-raising fashion. "'Oh, my, oh, my, mercy me!' faltered Jinnicky, 
and scooping up the nonagon cat, he jumped up on a red tabaret. Stop him, somebody, stop him! Whoa there, come back here, Thun, come back, we want to look at you. Running after the thunder colt, Randy caught him by his plumy tail and hung on till he actually did stop. And he doesn't make a sound when he gallops, not a sound, marveled Jinnicky, edging nervously over to his throne and taking a seat beside Planety. A sound but soundless steed, har, har, har. And do not mind his breath, Randy, it cannot burn you now. It's cold fire and will not singe a thing. But how did you do it? demanded Kabumpo, touching Planety lightly with his trunk. Oh, partly by my red incense, partly by my red reanimating rays, and partly by an old incantation against entrancery, explained Jinnicky, as Randy brought Thun back and handed him over to Planety. Do you feel all right now, my dear, and as beautiful as you look? Oh, yes, oh, very yes, answered Planety, smiling shyly round at the red gin. And you, I know it now, you must be the wizard so wonderful of Ev. Wonderful, wonderful, well, I should say, hey, hurrah! Randy threw his crown up in the air and caught it, wonderful enough to save himself and us, too. Oh, so many things have happened, Planety, since you and Thun turned to cold metal in that awful cellar. I must make a note, muttered Jinnicky, patting Thun rather cautiously on the neck. I must make a note to clean and cheer up that cellar. My mercy me, I haven't been down there for years. And if I never see it again, it will still be too soon, grunted Kabumpo, leaning up against a red pillar. Look, Jinnicky, he muttered out of a corner of his mouth, as Randy and Planety moved over to one of the windows, and Randy began to tell the little princess all that had happened on Nonagon Isle, and Thun began kicking up his heels and talking to himself, just for the fun of the thing. Look, will these two have to go straight back to their own planet? That is what is worrying me, Jinnicky said speaking behind one hand and patting his hound, also released from its enchantment with the other. I managed to reawake and reanimate them, but, as you've probably noticed, they are changed. Most certainly they are alive, but no longer of living metal, see? The girl's hair is no longer of fine-spun metal strands, but it is real hair, still silvery in color, as her skin retains its iridescent sheen. But I'm very much afraid, as things are, that the princess and her colt are unfitted for life on that far and rigorous planet of theirs. Yes, Jinnicky nodded his head emphatically. I'm very much afraid they'll have to content themselves down here and live, eat, and behave generally as natives of Oz or Ev. What? trumpeted Kabumpo so fiercely. Nina jumped out of Jinnicky's arms and hid under the red throne. Oh, say it again, he begged, swallowing convulsively. Great grump, why, this is the best news I've heard since you've come up out of the sea. You mean they won't care, exclaimed the red Jinn, rubbing his palms nervously together. Care, spluttered Kabumpo, waving his trunk toward the small red sofa, where Randy and Planety sat in rapt and earnest conversation. They care for nothing but each other, old fellow. Right there, my dear wizard, sits the future queen of regalia, or I'm a blue-bearded nanny goat. Oh, my mercy me, you don't say. Oh, har, 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 how delightful. Why, this calls for a celebration, a feast, and a fiesta. Beaming with interest and benevolence, Jinnicky banged on the side of his throne with both fists and his elbows. Prepare a feast, he ordered breathlessly, as Ali Babel, his grand advisier, entered in a calm and dignified manner, showing no ill effects from his long months of servitude in the ruby mines. Prepare a feast, old Tollywog, there's to be a wedding, with rings, bells, palms, presents, and all the fruity fixings. A wedding? Ali Babel looked sternly at his master whom he instantly suspected of being the groom. 
Then, as the red gin, grinning wickedly, waved to the engrossed pair on the red sofa, he nodded briefly. In that event, he remarked, backing rapidly away as he spoke, I earnestly advise your majesty to have a haircut. Oh, my mercy me, did you hear that? screamed the gin, as he turned to Kabumpo, his face very red and angry. I certainly did, roared the elegant elephant, giving Jinnicky a playful little push. Hasn't changed a bit, has he? And neither have you. The last time I was in this castle, he was advising the very same thing. That's all he ever thinks of, fumed Jinnicky, fingering his long locks lovingly. Then, as his eye rested again on the happy little princess and the prancing thunder colt, his expression grew milder. Randy! Randy! he called, jerking his thumb imperiously at his royal guest. See here, my boy, he explained, puffing at his cheeks importantly as Randy came to stand beside the throne. I have done my part to save your little princess, and now you must do yours. Unfortunately, Jinnicky's face grew long and dolorous, unfortunately, Planety and Thon, from this time on, will be unable to exist on another planet. So now, without a home or country, what will become of them? In mock distress, the Red Jinn stared down at his young friend. Oh, Jinnicky, how wonderful! Oh, Jinnicky, do you mean it? Thank you, thank you, thank you! Pressing the little Jinn's hands, Randy went racing across the throne room. Planety, he whispered breathlessly in the little princess's ear, how would you like to be queen of Regalia, to go back to Oz with Thun, Kabumpo, and me, and live in my castle for always? Oh, I think... Planety's soft yellow eyes fairly danced with surprise and happiness. I think that would be very night. Oh, Randy, that would be netiful. Netiful. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Silver Princess in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 20. The King and Queen of Regalia. The feast to celebrate Randy's and Planety's wedding was the grandest and merriest in all the merry annals of Oz and Ev. It was, in fact, a double celebration. The Red Jinn's return and his victory over Gludwig was enough to keep his subjects cheering for days, and to honor his rescuers and especially the little princess of another planet and her royal consort. The Evians outdid themselves, putting on one show after another. There were parades and pageants, fireworks and speeches, and so many presents and parties it makes me jealous just to think of them. Over and over again, Planety and Thun rejoiced in their new life and way of living, and eating the delicacies prepared by Jinnicky's chef was not the least of its privileges. In the Red Jinn's castle, eating was a pleasure as well as a necessity. But after a month's merry stay, during which every point of interest in Jinnicky's vast realm was visited, the travelers bade the little Jinn a hearty and affectionate adieu. Mounting Kabumpo and Thun, and laden with gifts and good wishes, the young king and queen set out for the land of Oz and their own royal castle. Uncle Hoochafoo had already received his instructions, and as Randy had predicted, things were very gay, very different, and very cozy in that regal and mountainous little kingdom. Planety's staff, powerful as ever, was a great help and protection to the young rulers and the small red handbag that packed itself went on many journeys with the little queen of the country. If this story were beginning instead of ending, I could tell you a whole book of adventures they had, traveling with Kabumpo and Thun through the great land of Oz. For these days the elegant elephant spends almost as much time with Randy and Planety as he does with the royal family of Pumperdink and most of it in travel. 
and in Oz what a gay way one travels. The other morning, as I lay dreaming of them all, I got to thinking how night it would be if the horses on milk wagons here were all soundless gallopers like Thun. End of chapter 20 An End of the Silver Princess in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson